30 or 45 seconds here, uh, when we see our numbers top out, we will get this conversation started. We're very excited uh, everyone can join us for this uh, really important topic with a couple of terrific speakers uh, from Congress who are coming off a big victory on the House floor yesterday. So. All right. We will, we will get going. Uh, my name is Lester Munson. I'm a senior fellow at the National Security Institute. I am uh, very honored to be hosting this event with two uh, young and up and coming members of Congress. Uh, Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton, Democrat of Virginia, Congressman Mike Waltz, Republican of Florida, who are working together in a bipartisan way to highlight human rights issues and have the impact on the coming Winter Olympic Games. Uh, so I don't want to spend a lot of time introducing them. I think you want to hear from them and the work, the important work they're doing. So Congressman Wexton, I'm, I'm going to go to you first, and I'm hoping you can describe for, uh, for the audience the, uh, the very significant thing that happened on the House floor yesterday regarding tennis star Peng Shui. Well, Mr. Waltz and I had a resolution uh, that, that condemned the uh, IOC for their, for their uh, lack of human rights protections for its athletes and called on China for a full and, a full and, fair, uh, full and fair investigation of the allegations that were made, made by Peng. We also called upon them to, to allow her to, uh, to be seen, to be, to, be, to be able to travel and to be able to communicate with, with the Women's Tennis Association. And this resolution passed unanimously on the floor of the House of Representatives yesterday, which is pretty incredible. <laughs> Uh, Congressman, I'd love to get your thoughts on uh, on the import of this uh, of this vote. Congress is taking a, a pretty tough position with both China and the IOC. And then, what are the prospects for perhaps future action on this issue? Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate uh, Representative Wexton's leadership on it. Uh, you know, I've been frankly concerned uh, that our approach to China um, was becoming a partisan issue. Uh, it should not be a partisan issue. Human rights should be a bipartisan issue. And um, what I believe is, is perhaps the greatest adversary the United States ever faced in the Chinese Communist Party. And I say that very carefully, uh, that is no issue with the amazing and wonderful Chinese people, Chinese culture, incredible history. Uh, but I do think the Chinese Communist Party particularly under the leadership of Xi, um, is uh, exponentially becoming more aggressive, more authoritarian, uh, more repressive uh, to ethnic minorities uh, and its own people. Uh, and you know, this case being uh, highlighted uh, in, in the case of Peng Shui, I think exemplifies a lot of that. This is a three-time Olympian, uh, a number one, in the world, uh, tennis doubles uh, champion. I mean, this would be like a U.S. tennis star. I don't know, Chris Everett or Serena Williams uh, leveling a very credible uh, accusation against a vice president in the United States and it not only being not taken seriously, um, not investigated, censored, uh, and then she disappears uh, and then only appears under clear coercion. So. Uh, that I think, you know, I, I, again, if we don't take a stand on this, I don't know what we would, number one. And number two, I really want to very publicly and forcefully commend David Simon of the Women's Tennis Association for making a very principled stand. Uh, this was not just symbolic. I mean, it was, uh, they, the WTA had their um, world championships in China just last year. It's a significant part of their revenue. Uh, and, and frankly, unlike many other sports organizations, the WOTA is not turning a blind eye when it comes to their balance sheet and, uh, and, and took a stand for what's right for women's rights and for human rights. And, and Les, I would just add that for, for those of you, the, for those people at home who aren't as familiar with this, with this subject, you know, Peng Shui, she, she disclosed on, on Weibo on the social media app in China, that she had been sexually assaulted and, and abused by 
by one of the very high ups in the Chinese Communist Party. And immediately thereafter, she was censored. All, all references to Peng and to, and to tennis and to all kinds of things were, were, were scrubbed from the internet. Um, she, was, she was disappeared. You know, she hasn't been heard from publicly since that time. It's been, I guess, almost a month at this point. Um, and, so, and so the WTA became very concerned and the CEO, uh, Mr. Simon was very, was very adamant that he wanted, he wanted you know, objective proof that she was okay. And so the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, intervened, and they and they they had they had a video call with Peng, where she she appeared fine, and you know they 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 then they but they would not disclose the uh, the the how the how the call was arranged. They would not they would not provide the recording of the call. You know, I mean, all kinds of really really sketchy details. And so, you know, that's that's very concerning that the IOC is doing that, especially with the Olympics starting in Beijing in a matter of weeks. And we're very concerned. I think I speak for Mr. Waltz as well. We're very concerned about the safety of U.S. and, and international athletes in, in Beijing if the IOC is not able to protect their safety. Uh, I, I really want to explore a lot more the, the issue with the IOC. But first, Congresswoman, let me let me ask you uh, what, what I see as it's kind of an amazing trend, which is uh, women athletes speaking up for the rights of athletes, broadly speaking. And I'm thinking about what happened with the U.S. gymnastics team, thinking about some of the stuff that's been going on in women's soccer and women and the WNBA. And now we've got a, a, a female tennis star, perhaps China's greatest tennis star, uh, a woman. And it's, and it's the Women's Tennis Association that's really taking the boldest stand here of any of these sports organizations, can you can you just talk a little bit about the role of gender and the role of women on the on the world stage right now? It seems so important. Absolutely, yes, and I want to commend the WTA for actually doing something about it. For not just paying lip service to these to, to things like women's rights and and you know stopping sexual abuse and sexual predators, um, but you know I think that the Me Too enter uh, movement has really entered the sports arena. And women, women are standing up for themselves and standing up for their, for their friends and colleagues as well. And people are finally starting to listen. That's, I think that may be the big difference is that women feel empowered to come forward and speak out and that, that people are actually doing something about it. Uh, Congressman, I'd love to get your thoughts on, uh, on that issue or uh, in particular on the International Olympic Committee and their role in what's happening with Peng Shui right now, and how, while they've, uh, uh, you know, tried to look like they're facilitating outreach to her, what in what in fact they're doing is, it appears to me, is collaborating with the Chinese government in their efforts to oppress her. Could you comment on that? Well, I think you described it perfectly. I mean, that's certainly what it appears to be—a collaboration um, uh, and coordination. Uh, you know, with this oppressive regime, uh, and rather than standing with the WTA and saying she should be able to travel freely, speak freely, uh, answer even basic calls from her colleagues and teammates, and and uh, and and again, WTA President uh, Steve Simon, uh, she hasn't. No one's been able to reach her except these very scripted videos. Uh, and if it does come out uh, that that was some type of collaboration or coordination um, uh, with the IOC, which has a lot at stake right now uh, and is under a lot of pressure uh, to move the games uh, away from Beijing. 180 human rights organizations uh, have called on them to do so. And keep in mind, there's a real history here from the 2008 games where uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party made a lot of promises and a lot of assurances the IOC echoed those assurances, and yet, you know, I, I think it's very safe to say that uh, the CCP's uh, atrocities have only grown far worse uh, now with over a million Muslims uh, in concentration camps and an ongoing genocide, uh, as, um, as described by both the previous administration and this administration's State Department. So, look, I, I you know... I, I think there's a lot to be gained and a lot of ground here. Um, well, there's a lot to be gained from the IOC to kind of help make this go away and appear, help it, this appear to be fine. Uh, I agree with Representative Wexton, and this is very sketchy 
And, um, and, and I already believe that the IOC is, is in contravention of its own stated morals and values uh, and ethics principles by having the games in, in Beijing. The fact that they vote on the location in secret uh, is something that I think needs to change. Um, and, but, but, you know, we'll see, um, you know, where this all, where this all goes. Uh, One of the things that I find so disappointing is that we're, we're giving a platform to the CCP right now. You know, yeah. when, when the Olympic games start, they'll be on NBC, you know, they'll have the big opening ceremony as they did in 2008 and everybody will be all wowed by it and everything. And, and I don't know that they will we'll have the kind of, kind of counter program that we counter programming that we need to see about what's actually happening. This, this, you know, the Uyghur genocide and what they're doing with these camps and forced labor. So we need to make sure that people are aware. Congresswoman, Unless if I could just jump in there, I mean, I'll, I'll just be, be blunt. I think the IOC should be ashamed of themselves. NBC should be ashamed of themselves. Um, it, I, I know you'll probably get to this later on. I do, you know, the IOC has consistently taken the position. We don't intervene in politics. That's not our role. We're a neutral body. But what I don't think has been talked about enough uh, is, is the, you know, the fact that the IOC has intervened in the past. Uh, they banned any Olympic games from occurring in South Africa over apartheid uh, for nearly 30 years. In fact, they took it a step further uh, and banned the South African Olympic team. So, you know, everyone, you know, kind of mentions the athletes and what about the athletes? Well, the IOC had no problem with banning those athletes uh, over apartheid from participating in any Olympics anywhere in the world uh, for nearly three decades. But why now such a different position when it comes to an ongoing declared genocide? And the only difference I can point to is the amount of money involved. Uh, NBC alone, we know that contract was over seven billion dollars uh, uh, to the IOC. So uh, you know, again, I, I think we have yet another entity that is awash in Chinese money and and willing to turn a blind eye to basic basic human rights and principles um, because of their balance sheet. And I think that's a that is a sad state of affairs. So so many issues to pursue here. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about, uh, the Congresswoman and I, a little bit before the show started was the fact that the International Olympic Committee actually has official observer status at the United Nations. Uh, so they are an official participant in the affairs of the General Assembly. Is that something you think that our diplomats, that American diplomats and hopefully other diplomats would look into and perhaps try to change? You want to take this one, Mike? Oh, I'll take, yeah, sure. I'll take that one. I mean, Please. well, look, they, not only um, do they have um, that official status that, that we are taking a look at right now, actually, but then also uh, their tax exempt status here, uh, here in the United States. Uh, and again, there are a number of, of regulations on the books that if you um, are found to have facilitated or collaborated in some type of abuse uh, and facilitated and collaborated with a government uh, that, has on, that has an ongoing genocide. I mean, again, I think this would be akin to the IOC having uh, an Olympics in Rwanda uh, in the middle of that genocide. I mean, it is well-known, well-declared, well-defined, and yet they're still moving forward. Um, then I think all of those things are on the table. Uh, so the administration uh, has announced this diplomatic boycott of the Olympics, which means uh, that we're, the U.S. is not going to send sen senior dignitaries, perhaps the vice president or someone similar, uh, to be the official U.S. government representative at the Olympics in Beijing just two months, less than two months from now. Uh, D and, and a couple of other countries have joined us, uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, uh, Canada, have indicated they're also going to do this diplomatic boycott. Do you think that is a sufficient effort to express official U.S. displeasure with what's going on in China? I mean, it's not nothing, but it's not enough in my mind. I mean, I have been very public in, in saying that I thought we should boycott, boycott entirely. And I understand why they're doing it. You know, there are pros and cons to both sides. I do think that this will, you know, that, that, this, that this allows 
um, allows the U.S. athletes obviously to still compete, and I, I certainly understand that you know people have worked their entire lives for this chance to compete, and especially with the delays for this game taking place because of COVID, you know it certainly adds to the adds to the to the to the pressure on that. But you know um, it also it also having a diplomatic boycott makes it more likely that other countries will come and join us. So I anticipate there will be a number of other countries coming and joining us, and I think that that is. That, that is going to be very, very helpful because there's always strength in numbers. So I think that as, as the, the Olympics get closer, we'll see more and more countries coming and joining us in this diplomatic boycott. And I think that you can judge that, that it's, not, it's not nothing because Beijing is so unhappy about it. I mean, we heard from President Xi that he was, that it was, that it was, there would be grave consequences and that he was very, very upset. So, you know, that tells you that it's working in some, to some extent because it makes them very unhappy. Congressman. Well, I, I was the first in the House to introduce a resolution in, back in February um, calling for a full boycott. And, uh, and we've had a, a, a number of members, I, uh, I, I know it's over a few dozen, uh, join us on that. Um, and, but I want to be clear that that was after a series of requests over a period of years uh, asking the IOC to move the games. Right. So I, I understand the pushback on the full boycott. Well, what about the athletes? And absolutely. I mean, my heart breaks for them. But it's the IOC who put them in this uh, in this difficult position of having to choose between their values and and being able to compete. Uh, but you know, it became clear that the IOC was not going to move the game. So at the one year mark uh, out from the games, we did call from a, for a full boycott. And I would just, you know, again, address the athletes issue. You know, I would ask them uh, and have asked many of them, you know, if the United States had a million Muslims in concentration camps, if they were wiping out entire cultures as they are with the Tibetans, if they were literally disappearing people in the middle of the night in Hong Kong, uh, if they had, you know, if we had unleashed a pandemic on the world and refused to cooperate with any investigation and in fact were then disappearing doctors and journalists who were trying to raise uh, the alarm, would those athletes be demanding to compete here? I would, I would <laughs> guess not. I think they would be protesting uh, uh, like many others. So again, why the difference then when it comes to China? I would ask those same athletes, did they disagree with the IOC banning South Africa over apartheid uh, and banning their athletes from competing? I would probably guess not. So I'm, I'm struggling to understand the double standard when it comes to the CCP's abuses um, and, and, you know, would encourage them to join Inez Cantor uh, and others who have really f literally put their careers and money uh, on the table. Um, and, and as he, I think, very eloquently has said, no amount of gold or silver or bronze medals are worth, um, you know, these atrocities and, and their principles and values. And I hope that the athletes will feel will feel safe in order to come out and talk about these things, you know, because yeah. they're going to have a platform there as well. And I hope that they all bring it up and I hope that they make it clear that this is unacceptable. You know, another another issue that I think is important is the issue of the forced labor and the Uyghur Muslims and, and everything that's happening. In. And, and my colleague, Mr. Waltz, has made has, has already has already painted the picture of these concentration concentration camps of what's happening with people disappearing about the forced sterilizations and rape of women, um, you know, in these camps and, and everywhere. Um, it is absolutely horrifying. And, you know, I think that, that for the people who say, gosh, how could, how could we as a, as a nation and how, how could we as a, as, a, as a world have allowed the Holocaust to happen, right? And all those people say, well, if I had been there, I would have done things differently. And now we see it happening in front of us in slow motion, you know, and they don't have gas chambers, but they have concentration camps and they have they have forced sterilization and rape and, and you know, that sort of thing. And so where are all these people right now? And everybody's slow walking it. And I think that, that that's one of the things that's very disappointing and horrifying to me. I, I, before we get into a kind of a broader conversation about, uh, about China's record overall, I wanna, I wanna focus just on the athletes again, just for a second and the incredible opportunity that these athletes have when they're in the spotlight at the Olympic games the entire world is watching, and let's assume that that the games go forward and the U.S. and U.S. athletes participate. What can they do when they're there in the spotlight? And I, and I'm thinking of the examples of um, uh, of the track stars in Mexico City 
who uh, gave a very symbolic representation for civil rights. I'm thinking of Jesse Owens in Berlin in 1936, who put the, who very uh, specifically put the lie to the whole Nazi ideology uh, in front of the world. What what can our athletes and other athletes, and really doesn't have to be American athletes, it could be anyone who feel strongly about human rights and democracy, what can they do when they're in the spotlight there to demonstrate that they stand with the Chinese people who are being oppressed by their own government? And, and you know, whether it's Peng Shui, Unless, the Uyghurs, or whoever. Can I, can I just jump in on that real quickly, if you don't mind, um, sure. Rep Absolutely. Reflex? And yeah, look, I, I think that the, the, the flaw in that argument of, of hey, let's, um, let's, let the athletes compete and they can speak out and it can be a platform for them to speak out. The flaw there in this modern age is the techno surveillance state that the Chinese have that, you know, that wasn't present in Mexico, wasn't present in Germany. Uh, and frankly, how compromised many of our media institutions uh, have, have become. So I'm not confident at all if someone wore a uh, Free the Uyghurs t-shirt up on the medal stand or somehow tried to highlight the abuses and use that platform, I don't know that NBC would air it, uh, just to be candid. Um, because uh, if you look at what we know about the contracts, they can't air anything derogatory uh, to the CCP. I mean, it really is a truly a, a massive and grotesque compromise of basic of, of basic values. So if you look at, for example, Disney um, just uh, eliminating and self-censoring any mention of Tiananmen Square or Taiwan from any episode of The Simpsons that they're running in China, uh, if you look at how Hollywood is self-censoring uh, Taiwan or Tibet from any of its movies, I don't know that we can expect to see NBC do anything differently. And then secondly, if I were a parent, um, I would be sitting those young athletes down and saying, you truly risk going to jail or disappearing if you do this over there. We just had an NBA star uh, reemerge after he had disappeared for 10 months. And it turns out he was in isolation uh, in, in, in China where he had literally just disappeared off the streets. So I would, I would really be afraid for their safety. Uh, and, and it's, in violation of Chinese law. Z has put a law in the books in the wake of the Hong Kong um, seizure that, uh, that any criticism of the state anywhere in the world, uh, so even if you do it before you leave for the Olympics, technically you are in violation of Chinese law and I wouldn't put it past them uh, to take those kind of draconian measures. That's exactly right. And, you know, we had a hearing, I serve on the, the, the Congressional Executive Commission on China. We had a hearing on this very topic with, with sponsors, with representatives of sponsors and a member and a representative from the US, 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 US Olympic Paralympic Committee, USOPC. And, and the representative from the USOPC was saying, well, you know, they do have to obey the laws in the host country as well. So, you know, I mean, I think that that was just basically saying that we're going to tell everybody not to not to say anything. So well, as much as I would love for our, our athletes to get up on the medal stand and say and say and the Uyghur genocide and things like that, um, I do. I do share Mr. Waltz's concerns about whether that would be aired and whether that would that would open them up to really dangerous situations. Uh, all right. A quick message for our uh, attendees. If you have a question. For the members of Congress, please put it in the chat and we will, uh, we will deal with those from the chat. And I'm happy to uh, ask those questions of the two members of the House that we have uh, very graciously sharing their time this morning. Let's, uh, all right, let's expand the, the aperture here to overall US-China relations. Um, and, and just kind of broadly speaking, of course, the two biggest economies in the world, we are in many ways reliant on Chinese econ the Chinese economy for some of the things that we enjoy in this country. Similarly, the uh, China's growth is almost directly related to the United States. And, and we're going through this process of pulling apart supply chains of, of targeting Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises. What's the, what are the parameters for which we should be looking at, at that separation of the two economies? How far can we go to express our, our concerns officially about the actions China is taking against its own people and against other people? You want to go first, Jennifer? I'll, I'll start on this one. Sure. 
So, you know, I mean, obviously our supply chains are inextricably intertwined with China, right? I mean, if you look at Apple's iPhones, just about every component of those, as well as, as, well as the assembly is, is performed in China. So, you know, and it's very, it's very insidious the way that they have, they have you know, included themselves in, inside of all of our supply chains. And they've really, they've really been very, very clever about using the capitalist system in order to further their, their goals and their communist goals, right? So they, they, they ply us with their cheap labor and their cheap, and their cheap, uh, cheap minerals and whatnot. And, and so they, they, they take over our supply chains and now we can't do anything about it. But we can, you know, we can move our supply chains back to this country. I know in some, in some instances, that's what they're trying to do. But we can also, we can also make, make, uh, make it clear that we are not going to accept these goods made with forced labor. And that's one of the things that's another, that's another piece of legislation that passed yesterday, the Uyghur Forced Labor uh, Prevention Act, which is something that, that we have been trying to get across the finish line for a while. It passed last year, almost unanimously through the House. This went to the Senate. They didn't do anything on it. Now the Senate has a, has a competing uh, competing bill, which has passed. We passed our bill yesterday. They're going to go to conference and hopefully we're going to come up with a resolution. Uh, but even so, even with that, the administration is kind of asking for a, a toned down approach, right? So they they are they are feeling the pressure from the business interests to to tone it down and to make it make it a little bit more a little bit more targeted or whatever it is that they're trying to make us do, or at least slow walk it. But there's not that appetite for that in the House or in the Senate right now. So I do think that we'll co hopefully come up with some legislation that we'll be sending to the president's desk. Well, I, I certainly support everything um, uh, Representative Wexon just said. And I would just one more piece on the Olympics is the is the corporate sponsors. Um, and, and again, uh, I think they should they should be ashamed of themselves and relook uh, their own ethics policies. Um, in terms of wh what type of events they support and where. Uh, uh, you know, again, we ask that the IOC move the game so that we aren't in this position, um, but we do have precedent. It just uh, last year, or I believe the year before, you know, Toyota canceled their ads uh, for the Tokyo games over COVID concerns. So again, I'd ask if, if that was, uh, you know, a, a country's, pandemic policies were serious enough for you to pull out of the Olympics, but yet an ongoing uh, genocide isn't. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. It's totally discordant. Um, and, and for a number of these U.S. companies to, again, you know, talk about ESG, corporate governance, do, uh, you know, donate to social justice causes here, and that's not a commentary on that. That's fine. But what, it, you know, but I am calling out the hypocrisy then when they turn a blind eye uh, to ongoing uh, uh, gross abuses of women's rights, mass rape campaigns, as Representative Wexton referenced, um, uh, literally disappearing ethnic minorities, and then suddenly it's fine. And again, the difference is uh, the balance sheet. Um, and I want companies to make money all day long, uh, but to a point, not when it comes to these types of abuses and not when it comes uh, to our national security. That's the other piece I wanted to touch on, Les. Look, dictators love the Olympics. Uh, we all know what uh, Germany did after 1936, uh, but as I think less well known is that Putin invaded Crimea, quite timely to be talking about that again, two months after the Sochi Olympics. Um, so for these oppressive regimes to absorb the international spotlight and the legitimacy that comes with it, to enjoy that propaganda platform. For basically the entire world, uh, our athletes, uh, our corporations, uh, now at least the Biden administration has taken the stand, at least it won't be our diplomats, to be in their capital, waving our flags, turning a blind eye, uh, is emboldening to these regimes. So uh, I fear uh, for Taiwan, uh, in the wake of these Olympics. Um, I think that's a very serious uh, concern. And I do, we just can't under, I, I don't think we can underestimate the symbolism, the nationalism uh, and the platform that the international games provides to these types of, of dictatorial regimes. Um, and then finally on the supply chain piece, um, there is this back and forth in the house and the Senate and the overall um, uh, Uyghur forced labor prevention. Uh, 
But fortunately, I was able to get my amendment into the defense bill that at least limits the Defense Department from and anyone doing business with the Defense Department, which is significant uh, from purchasing from Western China. And again, shame on these companies like Nike and Coca-Cola and others that were actively lobbying and Procter and Gamble that were actively lobbying against uh, these these measures. Um, and to, I guess just to the final point, because I just spent a year on a supply chain task force, um, Representative Wexton is absolutely right. I would encourage our viewers, uh, look, when, when you're out Christmas shopping to the extent you can, and it's hard, but when you see made in China, put it down. Uh, to the extent you can buy alternatives made in the United States, please do so. Uh, it's not just a national security issue, it's a jobs issue for here. And I think you will see a move to the extent we can't onshore our supply chain. 90% of our pharmaceuticals now uh, are, are made uh, in China. Uh, their state media is openly talking about cutting off uh, uh, those pharmaceuticals if we don't align with their views. That's a, that is a national security, that is a national issue. Uh, and to the extent we can't onshore, then we should ally shore. Uh, I'm the vice chair of the India caucus. Uh, let's move those supply chains to countries like Malaysia, Australia, India, that are actively talking about replacing the American dream uh, with the China dream as the CCP is doing. And for those of you who are wondering who some of the sponsors are for the Olympics, uh, upcoming Beijing uh, Genocide Olympics, we've got Airbnb, Coca-Cola, Intel, Procter & Gamble, and Finvisa are some of the top ones. So just keep that in mind and, and spend your money accordingly. Let me, here, here. Uh, let me, let me do kind of moderator's prerogative uh, one more time before we go to some of the very good questions in the chat. And I encourage people, uh, if, if, you, if something has occurred to you, please put it, and you have a question, please put it in the chat. But uh, I, I'm really kind of wondering, based on the conversation we've had so far, is Congress going to look at uh, perhaps the U.S. Olympic Committee and the and the official role that the U.S. plays in the International Olympic Committee system? Should we be pushing, should Congress, should the American government, should the American people be pushing for reform of the overall system? As, as you said, Congressman, uh, dictators love the Olympics. Should we have fundamental change in the way we do international sports? I mean, it certainly is looking like we should. And I think that the tax exempt status is a good place to start. But I think that we need to we need to take a good hard look at the way that the IOC is doing business and see what we can do to to correct course correct on that, because, you know, this is not the last time this is going to happen. And in 2008, we all remember, you know, that that, that the, the philosophy was, well, this will open up China and make them more democratic and make them make them, you know, more attuned to the West. And it did the exact opposite. You know, they doubled down on all the abuses. You know, they started building the concentration camps and everything. So I have little doubt that the same thing won't happen um, after the 2022 Olympics as well. So, you know, I mean, I think that it's time, it's time that we modernize the way that the IOC does business and it's time that they have greater oversight and, and some accountability as well. Yeah, no, I would. I don't have much to add to that. I think that's that's extremely well said. It, you know, I could, unless I could see, you know, some type of gray area or wiggle room before the official genocide designation. But once that went into place, uh, which is a process at the State Department, uh, and and then we had a, you know, obviously difficult, contentious uh, transition to a new administration, and and they kept that same designation, then it's very clear. So for us to, I, I think part of that reform is, you know, countries with ongoing designated genocides probably should be, shouldn't be a place that we pour uh, money, um, uh, legitimacy, and, uh, and, and, and support our athletes competing in. Great. Okay, I'm going to go to some of the audience questions. Uh, we've got two two uh, folks asked, "What are the prospects for the Senate picking up the resolution that you two co-authored and passed yesterday? What are the chances the Senate picks that up and does something, either either adopts it or does something similar?" Well, this is a very timely question because just before I got on this on this Zoom, I got word from my LD, my legislative director, that that Rick Scott's office in Florida 
um, that, that he wants to pick this up and if he wants to know if that's okay with us and then he'll go, she'll go looking around for a democratic co-sponsor. So I think that, that's, that, that it didn't take long for the Senate to say, this is something we, we think that we, not, we, need to, we need to do as well. So I think the prospects are very good that it will get picked up and, and passed in the, in the Senate as well. Yeah, that's great. And, and Senator Scott, the, um, we're both from Florida, was one of the, has been very strong on this and has been one of the, um, one of several that's been writing, asking, um, pleading with the IOC to move the games, same with NBC and with others. So that again, I mean, nobody wanted a boycott. Everybody wants our athletes to compete. Um, we just want them to compete in a place that isn't literally enslaving and murdering its own people. Uh, so another very good question uh, from the audience. China has said they will retaliate for the, the diplomatic boycott. What do you expect uh, specifically that would actually mean? What, what is anticipated that China will do in response to this diplomatic boycott? Yeah, I think from my perspective, I, I think that's a lot of bluster. Um, uh, they, you know, a year ago, they threatened uh, the sanctions on anyone or any country that levels any type of, uh, of boycott. You know, we'll see. I don't know how effective that will be. And at the end of the day, um, as Representative Wexton said, they, you know, they need access to our economy more than, than we to them. Um, but I, I just don't think uh, they really have a leg to stand on. I mean, the abuses are, are known, they're out there. Uh, there's been a number of leaks now of official Chinese state documents that show it's been directed from the top. Uh, a number of videos uh, that are just grotesque of you know people with their heads shaved on their knees, getting loaded into rail cars. I mean, that couldn't be as, you know any more historic or ominous. Um, so I, I, I just don't see them really ha having a leg to stand on. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll see, but I, I'm with Representative Waltz on this one. I think that most of it is bluster. I think that they will try to do some some things for show, like maybe like maybe not not allow some movies to be released in China or something like that. But you know, we'll see. We'll see what they come up with. Uh, another question from the audience: There was there was a news report uh, in the last few days. I think it was from ProPublica about uh, the Chinese government. Uh, harassing Chinese students in the United States, Chinese scholars, putting pressure on them to change their behavior. Uh, what are so? I guess broad question: What are what are some of the other uh, human rights issues going on in China that we should be concerned about, and what what can be done to thwart them? Well, China surveils its population, you know, as a matter of course, right? So it keeps, I mean, surveils everything that they that they do online surveils everything that they're doing, you know, even just walking around in the community. Um, it's really, it's really terrifying. And so and nobody can step out of line. And if they do, they'll be picked up and disappeared. So it's not just, it's not just, you know, the Uyghur Muslims or the Turkic minority groups and things like that. It's everybody who doesn't tow the PRC's party line. So it's pretty scary what's happening in China. And that's one of the things that's really frightening is they, they spend so much and they spend so much uh, of their, of their resources and, and their and their energy on on things like AI in order to be able to you know to say oh well you went you went out your back door yesterday instead of your front door so that you must be up to something so and then they'll get picked up and disappeared sometimes for crazy little things like that so it's it's horrifying that what people have to live with in the PRC and and I don't see it getting any better in the short term. Yeah, no, certainly agree, and but less I think what you know what. Americans need to, you know, why does this matter to the everyday American? Um, and I think what they need to, uh, you know, what we need to really have a wake up call in this country is that because they, the Chinese Communist Party has deliberately created so many dependencies, we saw this in COVID with masks and gloves and gowns. Uh, our, you know, I already mentioned 90% of our pharmaceuticals. Now it's now 85% of our rail cars. We're trying to move to a green economy, but they control 90% of the world's lithium that, um, that you know, is a critical mineral for the batteries that we need uh, for our, our, our everyday lives and have explicitly threatened uh, Australia, Japan, 
um, and have threatened the United States as well, that if we disagree with their policies, if we call out these abuses, uh, that they will t take retribution in terms of these items that we need for our everyday lives. So that's why um, decoupling or at least diversifying our supply chains uh, is so critical to every American. That's one. And number two, the surveillance state, the techno surveillance state that Representative Wexton just described in China, they are now exporting around the world. Uh, that's why you see Chinese companies like ZTE, Hikvision, and Huawei, which are, you know, the world, you know, basically creates the infrastructure for IT for countries. They're giving the components away, but in exchange for that, mainland China gets access to the data and access to the IT backbone. So not only can they surveil you in China, they can now surveil who's coming and going uh, in Africa, in Panama, in Venezuela, um, in Argentina, uh, and that coupled with their debt diplomacy, uh, where they give these countries loans that they can't possibly repay and then take literally infrastructure, ports and grids and airports in exchange um, is creating a global uh, techno surveillance state that all feeds back to uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and if we don't wake up to it, and I think uh, come up with some counters for freedom loving nations, again, don't take this from me or anybody else as some kind of China hawk. Listen to President Xi's speeches, not the phony translations that they put out there, but the real translations where he's telling his country to prepare for war. He's openly talking about replacing the United States as a global leader, that he's advocating for their form of governance and socialism and communism versus free and open capital markets, freedom of the press and freedom of religion. That, that is a scary prospect for our, our children and grandchildren. And it's really not just a question about whether you can get your new iPhone at a good price. It's a question of for national security as, as Representative Walsh has, has so aptly put out there. Uh, this has been a really terrific conversation. I know you both have to go. I want to ask a really difficult question and hope for a quick answer from both <laughs> and kind of expand into the national security space. Uh, China has been making very threatening moves and comments about the independence of Taiwan. What should the U.S. policy be in response to those threats? And Congressman, you may have to go a little bit earlier. I'm, I'm going to ask you to answer first. I'll try to be brief. It's a, that's, that is, that's a tough question. But the bottom line is, the Chinese Navy is now larger than ours. They've launched more into space than the rest of the world combined. Uh, they've turned space and cyberspace into a war fighting domain. Uh, and um, sorry for the buzzer, but uh, all of those things, you know, I, I think when the, what Americans need to understand is our grid could be compromised if we choose to intervene in Taiwan. And why does Taiwan matter to everyday Americans? Well, if Taiwan falls and we allow it to, they will then control uh, trade and routes into Japan, into South Korea, into Malaysia, essentially by most estimates, 40 to 50% of global GDP will then be under their thumb. Uh, and that will affect every American's wallet, every business, global trade and supply. So, you know, as Hong Kong goes, the world goes, as Taiwan goes, uh, the world goes, and we have to uh, get off that slippery slope. What we need to be doing is helping raise the costs um, significantly in our support for Taiwan. There's a lot they need to be doing as well in fairness, um, but turning that country into a porcupine uh, and, 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 and coming you know, with a very clear position uh, that it's unacceptable uh, and not just us, but Japan, Australia, India, and others uh, that we will come to the aid of democracies around the world. And then finally, the thing that's so frustrating to me is this military buildup and their ability to, to take these aggression actions being funded with our money. It's U.S. dollars uh, flowing, whether it's through Wall Street, Hollywood, pension funds, BlackRock, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, J.P. Morgan with with you know Jamie Dimon uh, apologizing all over himself in recent weeks um, that it is our capital that they're raising here and it's our dollars that flowing over there that that is fueling all of this and I think historians are going to look back on it and really shake their heads. Congresswoman, 
Yeah, well, I would associate myself with the remarks of the gentleman from Florida. You know, he, he, he did a good job of, of kind of giving the whole lay of the land. Um, I think it's very encouraging that, that when, when President Biden met with or, or spoke, spoke virtually with Xi very early in his, in his term, he, he, did, he did indicate his support for the one China policy, but made it very clear that, that, that China should not try to, try to disrupt the status quo. Now, I do think that China is going to keep pushing, you know, because they do want to see how far they can go and they feel like, you know, maybe this is a good time. And then maybe that's something they're going to do after the Olympic Games or something. But I think it's extremely important that we make it very, very, very clear that, that we are going to stand up for Taiwan. You know, they, 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 are, they are attendees at today's democracy, democracy summit here uh, that's being held virtually. And I think that that's very encouraging. I know that Beijing is not happy about that, um, but that's encouraging. And I think also in engaging with our allies in the region about that as well is super important. So I think that it's important that we keep doing that as well. All right, we're going to wrap it there. Uh, huge thanks to both of you. And just as one American citizen voter, thank you for doing this in a bipartisan way. It's so encouraging to see, uh, to know that uh, terrific things are still happening in Congress, uh, both sides working together on issues that are so important. Really great to have you with us. Thanks for the, the terrific and provocative conversation. Um, and good luck promoting this in the Senate. Thanks, Les. Thank you.